My name's Jack Drury, I'm from Shaw, and today we are going to be asking what is the future of audio in theatres? Um, this question was come up with before the current situation that we find ourselves in, but as we started discussing it, we realised that it was going to become a big topic of today's conversation. So to help us through uh, and to try and answer that question, we have five panellists from the industry, all of whom have um, fantastic backgrounds and are well-versed in helping us answer this question. So I'm going to come to those uh, panellists in a moment. Which is a bit of, um, we also feel so the actual responsibility of this broadcast is with our uh, platform, which is Blue Jeans. But us as individuals have done our best to fortify our internet connections from family members, spouses, household pets, things of that nature. But issues can still occur, so please do bear with us. Um, we're hoping to talk for around 45 minutes, and then we'll have 15 minutes for questions afterwards. So if you do have questions you'd like to ask, use the Q&A function, which you should be able to see. Um, and if our provider does experience some uh, issues with the broadband connection, you will be invited to enable a low bandwidth mode, uh, and it should come up with that and, and show you how to enable that. Um, but without further ado, I'm going to come to our panellists to introduce themselves, and I'd like to come to Zoe first. Hello. Um, yes, yeah, so my name's Zoe Milton. I'm a um, freelance sound engineer. Um, started off uh, very much as a West End um, number two and number one, uh, and uh, moved in over the years to um, to more kind of broadcasting theatrical events. Um, and the majority of what I do is hiding radio mics for um, for, for performance. Um, when I'm not doing that, I am the uh, administrator for the Association of Sound Designers, um, which is a theatrical association looking after sound engineers from every part of their career. So um, those kind of future professionals that are just entering the industry right up to kind of seasoned designers, um, production engineers, um, front house uh, engineers, all that kind of stuff. Um, so yeah, that's me, I think. Thank you, Zoe. Um, next up, we have Tony. Hi, uh, my name is Tony Gale. I'm a freelance sound designer. Um, yeah, I started off working for a well-known uh, rental company, worked there for 15 to 8, well, I can't remember, 18 years, uh, worked my way up, um, and now a freelance sound designer. I've worked on shows as associate sound designer, mainly on shows like Tina Turner Musical, Aladdin, Dear Evan Hansen, um, uh, Groundhog Day, and many others in the West End, um, national and also international um, touring. Um, so, yeah. Uh, and I'm just here to um, hopefully give some uh, great advice and talk about the future of audio and theatre. Thank you, Tony. That's amazing. And um, Vicky, if I could come to you next. Hi, yeah, I'm Vicky Hill. I am a freelance sound engineer. Um, when we all got shut down for COVID, I was out in Australia with Cirque du Soleil, um, looking after front of house and monitor engineering for them. Um, I have also been out international touring. I was out in China with Evita. And then before that, I was in the West End looking after the Lehman Trilogy as head of sound. Um, yeah, you can find me mostly behind a desk or messing around with some radio mics. Thank you, Vicky. Um, Richard? Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Richard Brooker. I'm a, a sound designer, predominantly working on uh, large scale musicals in the theatre. Um, I started out mixing musicals a really long time ago and uh progressed on to or if you call it progression on to sound design um but i also can still be found mixing freelance for concerts and uh, do a bit of broadcast mixing and also run a recording studio so quite varied really thank you and uh, representing Shaw today we have stuart stuart if you could introduce yourself please hello everybody uh, my name is stuart moots um as jack said i work for Shaw. I'm the director for the Pro Audio team here in the UK, and we are tasked with looking after these lovely people in, in theatre alongside concert touring and the, the, the ever growing world of broadcast as well. Amazing. Thank you, everybody. That's our five panellists. So we'll uh, rattle straight into this. Um, and our first question is, is a big one. I think it's going to allow us to cover quite a lot of ground. So what role does the sound department have to play in events returning? This is obviously quite topical at the moment uh, with 
there have been some announcements about outdoor events coming back and the Regent's Park <clears> Theatre <throat> is going to be um, uh, putting on a production of Jesus Christ Superstar. So the question is, what role do we have to play as sound engineers in that happening? Um, I'm just going to come to, uh, I think we'll come to Tony first, if that's okay, um, to answer that one. Yeah, well, I mean, to be honest, it's the role that we'll be hopefully doing and um, that we've done before COVID-19, and that is amplifying and making it sound good so everyone can hear what's going on on stage or wherever the, the venue is. Um, you know, and hopefully we're allowed to be a part of that discussion on how we implement the post-COVID um, theatre, you know, and, and not be, you know, seen as a as a as a you know backstage facilitator um because very much you know i think a lot of people are going to be very keen to get back to normal as, as possible and one of that one of the reasons is that because they want to hear and see musicals and see plays and you know sound is very much fundamental in that so in terms of what we you know what we can do to help is basically do what we've done before but just do it more on a more personal hygiene level um, just improve that, which we're good at anyway, um, especially with IEMs and radio mics, um, and working with other departments to deliver, you know, a, a COVID-19, post-COVID-19 um, package. Um, does anyone want to come in on this and, um, you know, specifically about things that might have to change in the sound department? Do we think that there, there's going to be different working practices and whose responsibility might that be to, to, um, to, to put those into place? Sure. I mean, I hope it's everyone's responsibility, to be honest. I know it's our sound equipment, but I would hope that you know, when it comes to like comms, I would hope that everyone takes responsibility as they use them with um, musicians in the pit. I hope there's what I really hope as we return into theatre is this um, sense of shared responsibility, because I think in theatre, as we left it, a lot of responsibility fell on the technical departments, including stage management, I think is a big takes a, a lot of brunts of that sort of thing. And I really hope that from the top down, you know, from producers and company managers, production managers down, we are all encouraged to um, be really aware of each other's health, each other's personal space and the, the kit that we're using, what we touch every day. So I think that's something that maybe we, we could look to improve as we go back. You know, it doesn't all have to be negative things that we're looking at. I think sometimes we can look at it as a really positive thing that we're all going to be taking better care of ourselves and the equipment and buildings that we use and the companies that we surround ourselves with. I'm really hopeful for that as a positive outcome of all of this, to be honest. So I can see you nodding. Um, uh, what, what are your thoughts on, on this question? Where do you think it's? Yeah, I think both, like, both of those points are entirely like justified. I think that's what we're going to have to do. I think in terms of health and safety, we're going to be looking at um, maintaining uh, equipment and just you know it's all of those things about being kind of super aware like especially in my role you know I've been asked to think about how I would um, you know hide radio mics effectively but while still maintaining distance and all those things I think there as, I, as um, Vicky was talking I was just thinking about actually um, uh, slightly off the kind of um, audio amplifying kind of side of things but actually the innovations that look like they're kind of being thought about at the moment in terms of social distancing in terms of um, aiding all of those um, experiences so you know keeping people to be able to stay apart without really worrying about it too much you know like the, the um, uh, distance tags and those kind of things so so yeah I think we I think part of what makes audio really interesting and brilliant is the, is the creative minds that are involved and so I think it is going to be a case on a kind of show by show basis that we we really use our, our creative minds to think about you know whether there is you know extra amplification that's needed or whether there is a case of you know teaching the actors how to um, keep their equipment clean without maybe running it under a tap it's that kind of um, I think really. So on that point, then I'd like to come to Richard, and I'm thinking Richard a bit more about from the sound designer's perspective now. I mean, is there what can sound designers in particular do to to aid events coming back? Is is there a role to play there? Yeah, I mean, certainly. First of all, just to say that all those points just made, I think, are are great, and I agree with them. I just didn't step in to say so, but um, I think the role of the sound designer, we need we need to. Um, 
I think it's, it's not for me to tell other sound designers what to do, of course, but I do think, you know, that we're all responsible for the industry that, that, that we work in, and we're very much responsible for trying to get that back and help shape and form whatever the new future of our industry is. And there's, there's, there's no question it's going to be different. Um, as as Vicky said, that doesn't mean to say it has to be thought of as negative because it's different, because I'm sure there are a lot of things about the way the industry worked before that some of us would think needed changing anyway. So um, I think that uh, leveling out the playing field a bit is a really key thing. So I think from from uh, before I come on to what sound designers can do, I think that the industry as a whole needs to recognize that sound is just as important as any other in part of the industry. Um, I've, I have said this before, so if any of you have heard me say it before, then forgive me, but it's because I'm passionate about it. If you go and see a show, people always say, I, well, I went to see a show, I went to see a concert. Well, you didn't, you went to experience it, and half of what you experienced was the, what you were listening to, not just what you looked at. So as uh, the industry we work in is, is sometimes uh, a little bit over, um, uh, confident about everything that's visual and and they care very much about everything that's visual well we need to look at the sound being thought of in the same way and we can help a lot with bringing theatre forward because sound is uh, is all about communication theatre is all about communication and a lot of the communication is dealt with by the sound department so moving forward I think the first thing we need to do is that sound needs to be brought to the table at the same time as everybody else is in the industry so with the set designers the lighting designers the producers the directors the choreographers uh, the theatre makers, we're all theatre makers at the end of the day. You know, as Tony said, we're not just a facilitator in sound. We're a theatre maker. We're a creative industry. So we need to make sure we're at the table at the same time as everyone else is, because I think there will be a lot of uh, interesting things that the people working in sound will be able to help the other departments with in moving forward. Now, if specifically to answer your question on how do sound designers help, I think that sustainability is the biggest thing here, right? So, so uh, obviously, we are half creative and half technical, and in our in, in our side of the industry, and so the technical side of us wants to push boundaries and move forward and use new equipment and use new technology and try this and try that. I think we have a responsibility at the moment to look after our uh, rental companies. At the moment, I don't think we should be asking them to go and buy brand new this, brand new that when they haven't been earning any money for at least six months, and who knows how long that's going to go on for. So I think there's a responsibility on us to make sure that we're quite happy using the equipment that we've been using for the last couple of years, uh, which is all excellent and uh, and has a lot of it had come out just before uh, lockdown and had been purchased before lockdown. So it's not exactly redundant equipment. So there's that. I think we need to be careful not to over gadget and, and push our sound companies because the trouble is I fear that all producers will be looking for a a good deal well they always are but they'd be looking for a better deal because they also haven't been bringing in the revenue but also the sound companies are not going to want to do an amazing deal because they're trying to also cover their costs that they've been money they've been losing so it's a it's an awkward time um i think so we need to be very flexible with our approach in the way we design shows and look at it that's going to be best for everyone health wise best for the production best creatively and best financially and support all of our colleagues who work in the entire sound industry whether they be someone who's prepping a show in the yard at a sound company or whether they be the person putting the radio mic on whether they be the sound designer the sound operator so it's looking after all that that's what i would say if that was not too long an answer no, that's perfect. Thank you very much. And there's quite a lot. There, Absolutely, Tony, please do. Yeah, I just want to reiterate what Richard said. I mean, I totally agree. Um, and it's just short. I mean, to be perfectly honest, to be blunt, I think um, what we have to do as a un as a community, sound, sound and theatre community, is rein in the egos and increase the creativity to to basically sustain our, our industry. Um, and that means coming together and uniting as a as an industry. I think also there's a there's a responsibility as well to prioritise the people. You know, I think there will be budget cuts, and I I would like to think that um, designers will engage their creativity in order to make sure that the staff that are going to be representing their shows are going to be not overworked and not um, underpaid at the expense of the kit. Um, I, as an engineer, would much rather be paid a decent wage and get time off and use something, a desk maybe, that I've not used in a couple of years 
you know because i think actually that's the first place they're going to try and cut is our is our salaries and our, our support and cover and i would really like to see that for um with the sound designers alongside us as one package but i think that the people are what actually make the theater it's all very well having the kit but if you've not got the person operating it and maintaining it it's not really anything at all interesting i'd like to give zoe um a chance to come in there just because we're obviously talking about people now and this is a huge part of what the asd does so you know what i'm sure that the asd has been very very ridiculously busy over the lockdown answering these sort of questions you know in terms of what welfare is going to be like afterwards have you got anything that you'd be able to share on on what that has been like yeah i it's it's been really exciting to be able to to help our members come together um i think that's i mean that's what the asd was made for was to to get people who either work in very small groups or work alone a lot of the time to to be able to come together so so yeah the last couple of months have been very much about um making sure we um put as much information out there as we possibly can um dom bilkey who's our chairperson has been working like non-stop in the kind of lobbying side of things of making sure that the government's aware of who we are um of, of kind of trying to get our voice heard um at the same sort of volume as as other voices um so yeah so it it is and i i know that that is something that the members are really worried about is the is the the idea that producers are going to obviously want to keep their fiscal levels the same as they were pre-covid um and the way as vicky said that a lot of um, producers are going to think about doing that is to either reduce the workforce or reduce the amount of money that the workforce are being paid so there is at the moment i think a, a real kind of keen need to make sure that we we don't let that happen and we don't you know it's i think but again it's all very well isn't it you kind of you know i've not been working since uh, the end of march and uh in that situation if you don't have the support of a, of a larger organization or or the support of your sound designer and you're being told actually you know we need you to do this for a 70 quid a day day rate rather than your usual day rate then it's that thing isn't it it's that whether you're going to just jump at that because actually you've got a couple of days work or whether you you know you, you've got that support of of someone or you know a large organization to say actually that's not okay and we need to look at this but it's 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 weighing that all up between everybody's needs and yeah it's just it's 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 a hard job it's really i think what's been really heartening for me over this last because i you know i've kind of been introduced to ideas and and organizations that I didn't really have a, a very good understanding of what they were up to because you know everyone works in their own different departments so knowing that there are lots of organizations out there and there's loads of assistance on um, social media if you just want to go and find out and 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 knowing that all of those people are working really hard it's been really heartening over the last few months Amazing. Jack, I just want Jack, to. Could I um? Can I jump in there as well? So is that okay? Quickly? You absolutely can, Richards. I'll just, come just, to you, and then so, I'm going to come to Stuart just after that as well. So. Yeah. Sorry, sorry, Stuart, jumping in ahead of you. I just wanted to say while we're talking about people and and uh, and and the fact that all of those things that change, uh, in in a, in a potentially new setup, uh, and and I said before about you know um responsibility and sustainability. I mean, obviously, everybody in the world is going through this in different ways shapes or forms the first time probably ever that the entire world has been experiencing the same problems at the same time and uh whilst i said like we need to make sure that we're not pushing the companies to uh, sound companies to, to buy new equipment obviously we do also need to look after the manufacturers who who obviously can't sustain their their employees if people don't buy anything so i, I don't mean a global ban an absolute global ban on buying anything I don't mean that we, we obviously need to go but but going back to the people as well and i don't know if this is something that is going to be touched on later on in this but obviously everybody or a lot of people have been out of work since since march um and have no idea about their future and we're talking about specifically the sound industry there's a lot of potential issues with mental health and the way people are going to be when they come back to work and and you know we're all very out of practice at just being at work and the social element of that and also the professional element of that and how your mind works. I don't know about 
anyone else, but I'm definitely operating <laughs> on a slightly reduced capacity mentally, I think, because it's just been so strange, you know, and all, other things have happened and things that have been heartbreaking happen and things you see in the street upset you or you read things and need, see things on the news. It's a different world for all of us mentally. So I think that there also needs to be something in place for that is that we might book someone to come and mix a show and they might be brilliant and come in and two weeks later they might collapse in the heat because they just aren't ready for it. We have to have some kind of care package in place for that uh, and sort of fallback package in place for that because it could happen to anyone any of us you know and it's, it's not a sign of weakness it's just it could just affect us so i think i want to make sure that's discussed today without without uh, dominating the conversation and over to you stuart sorry because i butted in no, no. That, it's fine we'll definitely discuss that um that's that's on on the list of things to, to talk about thank you very much for bringing that up richard we'll, we'll come to that in in a bit more detail in a moment but i do want to bring Stuart in because there's been a lot um of discussion on this so far and, and obviously our position as a manufacturer in this industry is slightly different so what what's it looking like from our perspective Stuart? what have, what have we seen and what can we do well you know um we're a we're a we're a manufacturer the, the pro audio part of the weed relies on mass gathering so the past obviously few months has been very difficult for, across the board for you know for all those those industries that we that we work with so that's been tough and you know honestly speaking as richard said it's been tough to uh, adapt into that where where the whole team's used to going out and seeing people and having those conversations and um and it and it's and it's been difficult um but i think doing these things has helped us just stay engaged and and support the industries and i think that's been key and a key part of what of what Shaw has done over many many years is is listen to what to what you all say you know you, what the input you provide is valuable for what what we do going forward so it's it's absolutely key that we're that we're supporting that these these industries and making sure it's 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 still viable for everybody when we when we get past this and I'm and we're going to get past it. It, it it is a blip I know it's temporary um it's it's getting through this together that I think as as Richard said it's going to be the the important thing. So the, the common theme throughout this so far has been that we can expect differences when we come back. And I think we should expand on that a little bit more. I think, Richard, your point about mental health is very important. Um, I think that the other way that I would like to, to bring this in is what is the wider impact going to be beyond, you know, we're going to have to come back with social distancing. Uh, you know, the actual practical stuff is one thing. But what about everything else? What about the contracts? What about the people? What about you know, actually how this stuff works. Are there positives to be found in there as well? And I am going to open that up to the floor. Uh, anyone can come in on this. It's uh, fastest finger first. I think there's going to be a big thing. We'll, we will lose some of our really treasured colleagues um, during this period because, um, and I speak, you know, as an individual, but also on behalf of so many people that I've spoken to and that I know who have received no funding, um, no furlough, nothing. Um, and it's rough, you know, and some people have had to make big choices um, for themselves and for their families and dependents. And they've they will have had to choose different career paths and they won't be able to risk this again. Um, and I think we have to be so kind to those people because it's not a betrayal and it's not, you know, them bailing on us. It's it's them doing what's right for them. I think it ties back to the mental health um, point that Richard made. Everyone's in such different circumstances, even though we're all exper experiencing the same pandemic. And I think there's got to be a real awareness of that. And I think the landscape will change in terms of who is and isn't going to do certain types of work, who isn't going to go abroad, you know, who's going to only want to work um, on certain types of contracts. I think that's something else that we need to look at as an industry, um, how we collate our contracts so that we don't fall down the gap again. I think all that sort of stuff will need to be evaluated maybe further down the road, you know, but I think it would be our responsibility to look at that seriously again in the future. Yeah. Um, a, yeah, totally. Sorry, to, to totally. Be, um, yeah, yeah. Vicky, you're absolutely right. Um, I mean, the whole the work work life balance is going to change. And, you know, it has to change for in order for us to sustain our contribution um, to the arts at high level. Um, yeah, it's it is no 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 longer. Hopefully, will be the you know nine, ten, eleven, twelve hour working days of you know in a dark theatre. Um, putting on a show which is you know we all enjoy it and we all we all driven by it but ultimately it's to the detriment of our health our mental health as well and you know we just need to um take a step off the the carousel as it were and 
just look at what's going on the rat race and think okay how do we reset our life our lives and how do we set our industry and um, to make it better and it and that starts with the work-life balance and hopefully producers and and employees and theater owners will see that and will implement that and work with the the theater makers who are you know 70 percent freelance um hopefully hopefully they will you know work with us to make that change so looking at it from a, a, a constructive perspective, what opportunities could COVID present? What opportunities are there to go and fix this uh, going forward? Um, I think, Tony, if you, you, we'll stick with you to start off with on this. Well, I mean, the opportunities is, is that everyone now, the whole world are aware of, um, to, be, to, to, put, to put it crudely, personal hygiene. You know, people are now aware of that, which then leads on to people's personal space um re respect respecting each other um and respecting people's um feelings as well and um, which is all leads into mental health you know um it's you know it's a it's a it's an industry where we're a very caring and loving industry but at the same time we're a very cutthroat industry because it's such a small industry so you know if you don't if you don't know a certain person or if you don't get on with certain people you might not work at all you know, you have to be in it and know the right people to work. And I think post COVID, what's going to happen is that um, people are going to be a lot more aware of people's individual situations and be more sympathetic to people's individual lives. And I think that would that will be the benefit of, of post COVID. You know, everyone being respectful of each other. You know, life is not just about work. It's about your well-being as well. Um, I'll open this up to the rest of the panel. Would anyone like to add anything into that? The opportunities that present themselves after COVID. Yeah, I um, talk about this quite a bit in terms of what I like to call sort of theatre martyrdom, which is, and we've all done it, I bet everyone here, even people listening have done this, when you go into work when you're sick, you go into work when you shouldn't. Um, you know, everyone's been in that week just before Christmas when the whole company's ill, or that first week in September when the schools go back and something, you know, a flu goes around the company we've all been there we all come in and we've all we've all mixed a show with a bucket nearby or you know we've all done it you know and it's I really hope that that culture changes with this awareness of health um because I think especially in the first maybe year of coming back we're going to be doing temperature checks you know to come in through stage door that sort of thing is what we've been seeing from the guys out in Korea and I wonder I wonder how that mentality will then feed through into larger work-life balance you know am I going to push through and, and accept that I can't go to my sister's wedding probably not um, and I think that will then lead to better staffing cover for shows I think it's going to be an incredible time to be a tech swing I think you're going to you know show <laughs> your way that you know has been very undervalued before and people joining the industry new I think there's going to be some great opportunities there to be covering show roles on a regular basis and I look forward to that as somebody who works hard um, as a freelance engineer in 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 you know in theatre, you know. And I and I love to work. I love to do what I do. But I do think all of our lives and our industry would be improved by a better balance. I don't think you have to be there to be part of it. I think you can be somebody who's having a day off. You can have a two day weekend, and you can still be just as important to your team as you would if you were working. You know. 13 hours a day I don't think that's how we should measure our performance and our contribution and I think that's a real mindset sh mindset shift that we need to address as a collective is it's not turning up necessarily isn't always the best thing to do sometimes tapping out is the best thing to do and, and I really look forward to that for many many reasons even if it starts off as being about about physical health but I think that's going to be great yeah Okay. Uh, well, I want well, to, well said. Oh, Richard, yes, please. So I just, I just want to put, pick up on that to say, well said, uh, Vicky. Really, really great points out, outlining there, and also what Tony said, and and you know, and just to reiterate that fact that you know we do all come into this because we want to do it. It's not, it's not just a job. It is something that is dear to all of our hearts, and I think that that for decades has been inadvertently exploited it's not it's not a deliberate thing it's just that it, it it is uh because people are passionate because the show must go on people you know people make it happen 
And I think it's interesting for, you know, uh, all of us who work in this industry and give our all to this industry that the moment that the world has a crisis, which it has, that industry simply isn't there for us as an industry. And it cannot be because of the sort of transient nature of it as an industry, because no one works full time in it. They working on contracts. So even if you work full time as a soundie on a show, you only have a contract for a year and then it's renewed. In the, or as soon as the producers decide the show is finished, then your contract is terminated. So as an industry, it doesn't have any backup to look after us. And, and so that's a really important thing. And it's a real kick in the teeth for people who have given so much to that industry. I'm not saying there's a solution to that and, or that anyone should have done more within the, our industry, but it, it just is a killer to people, isn't it, to, to find that. Um, so I think that the most, the biggest opportunity that COVID offers us is the reset button. Is this huge reset? It's the chance to reset and reevaluate everything, not just in our industry, but we're talking about our industry. What matters? What is the most important thing? How can we do it? And how can we do it in uh, a much more sensible way than possibly we have been doing it? And it's not all based around profit margins and so forth. It's actually about looking after the people who make it all happen. So I'm really just just uh, sort of making an extended point of what Tony and Vicky have, have said, really. Zoe, I, I feel like oh sorry, oh, no. I say, uh, okay. water, be mindful about the prof about profit margins. Like I hate I hate for it to come down to it, but if we then go to producers and go, not only you know we're going to need to have a fourth member of our three person department or whatever. I think I think we've got to sort of creatively maybe come up with ways of making that palatable um, before it becomes a norm. You know, because I think they're going to want to come cut back. And what we're saying is we want more. Here we want better. And I think that always comes at a, a, a physical price, which I think I'm I'm all game for, but I think it's going to be a tricky discussion to have. Well, I'd like to come to Zoe on on the tricky discussion point. <laughs> yeah, I think there's I think there's two there's two points to that. I think with the with the discussions, and I think as part of who we are and how we live we're very much problem solvers so we see a problem and we want to create a solution for that and often um and myself included that you put yourself on the line in order to complete you know like richard was saying the show's got to happen and so quite often the solution is that you work harder or longer or you know faster and your day rate stays the same um, but i think this moment of pause and having this understanding that the show hasn't gone on um, is a is a is a really important time to be able to say to producers this is what will happen if we have if we don't have adequate cover if we don't have enough cleaners if we don't have all of these things that we need to put the show on when someone gets sick in our company that's the show gone but if we have adequate if we have adequate cover, if we can pull out one team and put another team in, then we're not losing the show. And it's I think I think we have to be really mindful of the idea that we are putting ourselves at the detriment of the show, and that if we you know if we want to um, protect ourselves and protect um, our industry in a sustainable way, we've we've got to not be afraid of. Um, having those conversations and being really clear about what we need. I don't think any of us are here to kind of feather our own nests or do anything like that. It's about being the word responsible and um, acting in a sustainable way so that we're not, you know, we're not trying to say that we deserve £5,000 a day for doing the job we're doing. We're just aware of, you know, like the hourly rate and, and all of those things and, and whether we do that. Uh, as a group so that we're stronger or whether it's just something that we all kind of agree on to, to move forward. OK, um, I am keen to move on to some other questions, but I would like to give the panel the opportunity to come in on that subject before we move on. So I'll pause for a breath if anybody would like to add anything. And I'm going to take that as a clear signal that we're we're ready to carry on. Um, don't forget the Q&A function. We will definitely have some time for some questions at the end. So if people listening in would like to ask further 
clarification on some of those points, please do ask. Uh, all the questions are welcome. But for the time being, we're going to move on to some slightly more political um, matters now. And the question is, how does the 1.57 billion figure affect the return of theatre? Um, and I think we have to think about this question in the frame of the government advice on returning to theatre that's also been published and some of the performances that have been announced. So I'd like to come to Richard first on this. 1.57 billion. How does that actually work? Right. Well, uh, I cannot claim to be an expert on any of this. So I have only read what I've read, um, which is probably the same as anyone could have read. But uh, whilst that seems like a very welcome package and indeed any support for, uh, for, for our beloved arts is, is great, that does get spread fairly thinly to include um, art galleries and museums and buildings like the Albert Hall, you know, all, all, all these things that have to share in it. And um, I believe um, that the, the, the idea is that the money is essentially going to buildings and, and, and theatres and so forth, as opposed to people. Uh, obviously, if, if the theatres receive this money, then it does allow them to hopefully retain some of their staff that they're, that they're saying they might have to lose. Um, and also, I suppose, to flag up one particular area of, of theatre, the pantomime season, which looks like it may or may not go ahead. Uh, and just to reiterate, I'm sure everyone knows anyway, but just how important those pantomimes are to regional theatres and the theatres that the, the, the pantomimes play in. They essentially fund the theatre for that year until the next pantomime, really. So to not have them is a disaster. Uh, if some of that money from the 1.57 billion goes towards replacing the pantomime money. If the pantomimes don't happen, then obviously that's a positive that would help keep those venues going. Because if those venues don't keep going, then whether you work in pantomime or not, it will have the knock-on effect on you. Because when you want to take your tour of your show or your musical out, there won't be any venues or in the regions to play in because it'll all shut down. So we don't want that to happen. Uh, I had one idea about that. Just, just a thought is that does do pantomimes have to take place at Christmas time? Something for us to discuss possibly another time, but they're only traditionally at Christmas time because that's a nice family festive time of year. But actually, the stories are are fairy stories. They could be in April or so. It's possible that maybe we could move if we can't do pantomimes at the traditional time of year. Maybe we should move them to another time of year so that the revenue stream still comes back in. Um, that's not the question you asked. I know. Uh, but, but you know, re really, uh, I think what the problem with this money is, is that it's supporting or that's not a problem in itself that it's supporting venues, but it isn't supporting people as such. And that, that obviously is a big is a big worry. And I would like to throw this back over to Tony, if I may, because I think Tony had information about the. Uh, the fact that some of this money is not new money, it's old money or something really political like that. Is that correct, Tony? Yeah, that's uh, from what I understand. And that's not me taking some of the money, obviously. That's just what I've been told. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, so, yeah, so, so places like the National Theatre, RSC, um, who are funded by uh, taxpayers, um, well, you know, predominantly funded by taxpayers, that 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 1.7 billion or, or 1.5 billion, wherever it was, includes the money that is already put aside to give to those organisations. So, you know, so it's not all new money. You know, it, it, I think the figure that will actually go to, to theatre is something like 80 million, which is, a you know, it's still a lot of money, but 80 million spread across all the theatre organisations and theatre um, buildings is not a lot of money. And like Richard said, it's for the buildings and not for the, it's not for freelancers or, or theatre makers as such. Um, hopefully it will filter down, um, but, you know, Let's see. So in that case, coming to, to Vicky, if we're looking at 80 million and it's all for theatres, that doesn't sound like there's a huge amount left for the human side. Um, what are your thoughts? So from what I understand, and again, I'm not an expert at all, that this is actually for more um, systemic kind of um, arts rather than individuals at all. And actually, to be honest, I think it's per personally, um, I feel it's quite it's really problematic in terms of recognition and I think for me that's something that I've really struggled with throughout this process is the lack of recognition of my contribution to the nation's economy and all that sort of stuff I feel 
there has been adequate um you know representation you know that it's been raised that we've fallen through the gap and then i think for this recognition to come so late in the day you know weeks after buildings started to 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 close their doors and people were being laid off in buildings where i've worked you know in front of house staff and for me it's quite problematic in terms of the mentality about um our importance to our, our national economy um and whilst obviously you should never look a gift horse in the mouth and money is better than no money and recognition is better than no recognition and at least it's a start it's a late start as Richard was saying about Panto, the decisions are being made now about Pantos and about those tours. We can't just tip a tour out on a week's notice. You know, we do have to have lead times. We do have to be looking at venues and supporting people and staffing shows. And I think there is a there is a big misunderstanding about what we do um, as theatre makers. And I think we do contribute. We do contribute a lot to our, uh, not in the economy, but national identity. And it is problematic that we came so late to this. Well, well, it was so late that help was given to us. And it is still problematic. The guidelines that have been issued by the government um, regarding return to work are problematic. There are lots of, there's lots of space in there for us to get involved and make our own suggestions and whatever, but it is also quite prohibitive so far. And to see so many outdoor productions being canceled this week, um, that was really hard because I think my heart goes out to the the whole team involved with the six tour. Um, what a, what a creative solution um, to get round something so prohibitive and then to have it pulled out like that. I think that's really really difficult, and I think there's just not a lot of realistic support for us. Um, money's not the only thing we need, really. Sorry, I'd like to come to you, if I may, uh, on this 1.57 billion, but also the, the specific government advice that was um, that was drafted and sent out. How, what did that look like when when that fell across your desk? Um, so, yeah, it's a lot, a lot to take in with it. All the, the um, back to work guidelines and the kind of um, safe return to work. Uh, you can uh, check out the ABTT um, website which has got a lot of the information on there and um, but basically the bits that I kind of pulled out and were paying attention to were things like screening um, so screening your front of house uh, engineer which obviously uh, is not ideal um, the uh, the separation of front of house and backstage was was another um, idea that was in there but like Vicky says it's all very open to interpretation and I think that has been a theme uh, not wanting to be too political but that has been a theme with this government is that we will produce guidelines uh, which are open to interpretation which almost I mean to me in a kind of cynical sense uh, allows the um, litigation to be passed on so um, you know you, there's a lot more room to say that well that theatre didn't follow the guidelines and that's why there's been an outbreak but um, so yeah not to get distracted uh, the screening um, the uh, backstage separation also looking at um, I think as Jamie said in the um, in the chat there's um, the idea of um, having one-way systems backstage of having uh radio mics uh that are cleaned and cleaned daily um but also how you then apply those you know like the radio mics or the in-ear monitors or comms or those sorts of things um so yeah so there's there's quite specific but it all seems fairly like looking as vicky said at the the rest of the world and how they've gone back to work it all seems fairly sensible but i think we do have to just be mindful of um making sure that each you know each show is um is assessed individually so that if if there's a, a show where you can be screened uh you know i've done horrible pathos uh, behind glass it's not ideal but it happened um and you you know if that's something that can happen for your show then great but if it's something that is then that's something that like richard says needs to happen right at the beginning of of the communication sound needs to be in there straight away saying what will work for engineers and designers and what won't Okay, I want to come to Stuart, um, and obviously this one's an interesting one 
to come out from a manufacturer's perspective, but uh, there's been a lot of discussion. I'd just be keen to hear your thoughts. And obviously, we speak to a lot of rental companies, a lot of theatres, a lot of engineers out there. So what uh, what are your thoughts on that figure and the government advice? Um, you know, I've just echo everything that everybody said. It, that, that, that number's got, it's going to be, well, without knowing where, where it's actually all going to go, but it's, got, it, it's going across. It covers a lot of industries. We're obviously... We get involved with obviously the concert tour inside as well, and you know the music venues trust and those guys and those grassroots venues are equally important to the, to all those communities. And I know you know they're they're looking at it, but again, just addressing what you said directly, Jack, in terms of um, rental houses, you know it, it, it's what everything said, especially you know Vicky, in terms of making sure we're looking after crew and. And I've, and I prefer repeating myself. We've, we've said this before. A lot of the time we spent during this time has been, you know, engaging with those people and and just making sure that we're listening. That anything can do that we can do, we 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 can do to help. But in terms of if that money, I, I, you know, I, it, it's going to help somewhat. Does it help us directly? Does it help those rental houses? I guess that's that's you know we'll have to wait and see over the over the coming months and see how and where it's allocated. Yeah, Jack. So okay. Yes, Tony, please. Uh, yeah, just uh, just sort of say as well. Um, yeah, even though that money, um, even though that money is not going to come directly to the individuals and the freelancers and the theatre makers, what it enables us to do, hopefully, is allow us to have a workplace to, to continue working in. So, um, you know, and, and and from a government's point of view, I mean, I've got to play devil's advocate here. You know, general public see us as people who prance around stage and make a bit of theatre and very arty and you know and do it as a hobby they don't see it as a real job they don't see they don't know anything about the backstage element they just see what's on stage you know the the pinnacle of the of the theatre making um and the government only respond well should they, they only respond to what the general public want and see and at the moment we were we're not priority I mean, we wasn't a priority at the start of the pandemic Quite rightly so, if, if you ask me, you know, key workers were and, you know, um, uh, uh, public public services, emergency services. And that's what they try to look after first. And now I think that's the reason why it's taken so long for them to, you know, finally um, come out with this package, even though, you know, it could be more, it could be better, but it's something and it's a recognition of, you know, we do, you know, we, we do deserve something and we are part of the makeup of this. Um, of this British culture and, 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 and the nation and, and the road to recovery. Really good point. Thank you so much, Tony. Um, I'm conscious of, of where we're at in time and we have had some really good questions come in. So I'm keen to get to those. Um, before I do, I'll leave this open again for a couple of seconds in case anybody has any further points they'd like to add just to bring this question to a close. Excellent. We will uh, go into the Q&A then. So we've got um, some questions coming. There's three that we've marked that I definitely like to ask. Um, if you've got questions that you're thinking of now, please do post them. We will probably have time. Um, but to start off with, we've got a question here from Jamie Ford. And Jamie asks, I think, Zoe, you, uh, you related to this earlier. How do the panel see the risks of microphone fitting in a post-COVID world? Do we see more cars fitting themselves or is it embracing PPE akin to hairdressers, etc.? So really good question. How is microphone fitting going to work post-COVID? I will open this up to, to the panel. Um, I think whilst on the surface, like what, what I think people would be tempted to say is, oh, let's teach them to fit, let's teach actors to fit their own microphones. I think that's a surface response. I don't think it's very helpful for a couple of reasons. One, I think you're doing somebody out of a job. Um, and also because, as we all know, um, you can have problems with microphones and you will still need somebody to be able to come and address that problem quickly and without a negotiation in that moment. I think we have to find a way of being able to safely and confidently be that close to each other in order to work in a theatre. So I think to say, oh, we're not going to do that anymore isn't helpful um so i think i think yeah ppe i think wearing masks i think hand washing sanitizing all that sort of stuff is is are going to be big players for us and i think we should really advocate for those sorts of solutions rather than passing the job onto the onto the acting company for sure yeah. i sorry. think as well sorry i'm just like jumping um, no, no, yeah i think <laughs> <laughs> uh, um for me i 
I see it as a, as a package of all those other um, uh, responses. So if you want to have a backstage um, industry at all, yes, absolutely. We cannot, uh, like, we cannot pass that job on. I think we've all been on shows where a radio mic has been fitted maybe by a DEP or maybe by a different wiggy, and it's caused so many problems all the way through. You know, an inconsistent mic position is a very bad scene in a, in a theatre setting, in my opinion. Um, so I think we we need to remember and recognise that the job that the number three and the number two are doing uh, night after night is is pivotal to the to the sound design. Um, and also, if you are going to be doing temperature testing before you go into the building, if we're keeping you know our hands clean and yeah masks, I think. But yeah, I think absolutely we have to make sure that that those roles because unfortunately, I think if we are looking at um, kind of keeping the bottom line healthy, it's going to be the number threes, the ASMs, the the tech swings that are going to be the the roles that people start looking at. It's like you know I know that they're already saying, well, why do you need makeup and wigs? Why can't we just have one person? You know, it's, it's all of those kind of things that will that will really degrade the experience um, for everyone backstage and stop our industry being particularly sustainable. Amazing. Um, Tony and Richard, as our sound designer representatives on the panel, um, what would your opinions be on, on, on this particular question? Well, uh, if I may go first, Tony, I, I, I really just support what's been said. I mean, I think um, something that's very, very unique about the sound department is that they pretty much interact with every single other department in the building. So uh, on a personal level and on a professional level, stage management come close. But, you know, we stage management don't normally look after the band or the pit or anything like that. And they don't have that much to do with front of house staff. You know, we we in sound literally do, I think, uh, get ourselves involved in every single department, you know, because whether it's because of comms or cue lights or uh, something to do with the pit or the music or the musician or something to do with the actors or fold back on stage or whatever it is, talking to the front of house about uh, somebody saying they can't hear over here or whatever it is, talking to the audience. You know, we're, we're involved at every level. So I think it's very important that. Um, uh that's recognized and that also that we don't try and uh palm off jobs on other people just to make it slightly easier and oh we won't need ppe then i'll just do it myself because you know i mean it, it's a skilled job it's, it's not like just sticking a mic on someone's head it's a skilled job um you know and and this is not recognized enough obviously it's recognized within this community that we're talking about now and and certainly jamie that asked the question you know he understands as well but but that you know it is not just oh yeah someone comes into my room and puts a hair griff in my head and then they walk out again and as long as it's on my head it sounds fine it is it, it's it's a it's not just even a case of protecting jobs it's about please will you understand the jobs we're doing not you know it's it's a it, it's a skilled job and and should be treated that way and no it is not available for anyone else to have a go at is my view yeah i mean yeah absolutely um, i i would say though i think this is one for sure to come up with a, a radio mic implant <laughs> makes our jobs a lot yes. more easier <laughs> so, now. Thanks. Oh, thanks, <laughs> Was that sure you'll pass that on? <laughs> <laughs> Iotech, yeah, clearly the future. Um, I mean, I will. Um, I think we will. Uh, we will go on to the next question. Unless there's anything that anybody else would like to add into this, um, I think we're all good. Excellent, fantastic question. Thank you very much, Jamie. Um, the next one that I would like to come to is from Phil Ward, and Phil asks. Um, does the future of audio in theatre include immersive audio or does the panel feel that the pandemic will arrest innovations like this as we get back on our feet? Um, Richard Brooker. Yes, good question. Well done. Great question, Phil. I don't think it will arrest it. I think it might temporarily arrest it because I think until we're aware of uh, who our audience are going to be, how many there are of them and where they're going to be sitting. It sort of negates that sort of technology. Um, that being said, I mean, who knows what we're going to do next? You know, if we literally cannot get people into theatres for the next 18 months because the pandemic just keeps coming and coming and coming, then we're going to need to come up with something different, which means we may well end up seeing ourselves streaming more 
uh, uh, productions and maybe stream them on a much bigger technical way than they are done at the moment, which I hope would involve the show crews and the show sound people as well as broadcast style. Um, and then maybe we'll be doing stuff in, you know, in sort of immersive ways or, or, or certainly in full surround or, or maybe some of the more immersive headphone technology uh, software sort of platforms that people are using now. So who knows? But I think in terms of in a theater, in a, an arena, in a concert situation, I think it will probably uh, put it on a back burner simply because of, as we said before, budgets and, and, and an uncertainty about where people will be listening from if they will be at all. That's, that's my personal opinion. Good question, though. Yeah. Um, um, I'll open this up to the panel. Tony, yes. Follow on to Richard's point. Um, yeah, it's a good question from there, Phil. Uh, yeah, it, it's a. Uh, it, it could go the other way as well. I think it could be that now that we have to work with rental companies to work with what they got in stock to put on shows, it might go back to old school sound designing. You know, where you have A B systems maybe, or you know, you have uh, you know basic basic sound engineering skills. You know, you work with what you got and you make it sound as good as you got. And the audiences and producers might get used to that and think, you know what, why am I spending £6,000 a week on immersive audio sound system when I'm getting just as good results with, you know, traditional speakers on the pros or, you know, or, or you know, you know, traditional surround sound speakers, as, as it were. Because um, let's face it, most, most, of, most of the audience don't understand or don't even know they're in an immersive audio um, production, you know. They, they just assume they're watching TV and it's there at home and you know, I want to hear it come from behind me and it's there. They just assume that is what it's like all the time. They don't realize the, the, the gains in technology that we've done in the last 15, 20 years. You know, they just think it's always been like that. So, you know, to go back, if we go backwards, become the new norm, they might just accept it. And, you know, it will be even harder for us to introduce immersive audio because it's be cost prohibitive. But maybe I'm being negative. Now, there's a really interesting question that I'm going to come to next that kind of goes a bit deeper in this, Tony. So we'll hold on to that thought. But before we do, um, Zoe and Vicky, uh, any thoughts on immersive theatre becoming uh, the next thing? Vicky, I think you're, you're ready to come in. I just, what I would just say is that we're a really creative bunch. And I think all this downtime has actually led to loads of people having some really cool ideas. And I think, um, yeah, there might be a pause because people are going to want to put their money behind dead certs um, for a little while. But I think maybe when we get to the point again where we're all afloat, I think all of this time where people have been tinkering away in their own home studios and, and having a little play around with the back ends of sort of, bit of coding and all that sort of stuff, I think some really cool stuff gonna, is going to shoot forward and it's going to be maybe in an unexpected avenue. But I think there is still space for that. And I think as soon as we work out how we're going to return to theatre and then we work out what those challenges are, there are going to be some really cool creative thinkers who are going to sort those problems out for us. And it might not be down the track that we thought we were going down, but definitely down a different creative track. You, know, you can't stop creative people from being creative at all. Really exciting. Zoe, I'll come to you. And I know that you did some work with Blackout uh, the, the, uh, yeah. in the last year, back when we could actually go to places. Um, what are your thoughts on the immersive theatre? <laughs> yeah, that's, that's kind of what I think about. It's, it's, it's really like just the, the Vicky's idea is like positive and it's so true. We are such a creative bunch. The, um, the Blackout project was, was amazing and was, um, a, you know, just, uh, in its entirety uh, an amazing experience i think even as makers and as people that experienced it but what you have is um a, a very personal experience so obviously with that comes a very reduced uh, audience participation um, amount of people that can get through it so so yeah i think definitely it's it's part of our future and it's part of the, the kind of, um overall theater spectrum but yeah i I don't know whether we could pin our hopes on that being the thing that that makes everything okay because it's such a small amount of audience that you can get through in a, in a day. So, but yeah, it is it's an it's an amazing thing and great for storytelling. Stuart, this is a different difficult one for us because we don't really play in the immersive theatre world too much. We we deal with the input side of the snake. Um, but regardless, what uh, what are your thoughts on immersive theatre? And and if um, 
if there is a bit of extra there, what perhaps is going to be different in terms of our, you know, in terms of our approach to theatre and, and what and what innovations are we looking at? Well, I think you know we're we're the first part of call, we're the first part of the chain, aren't we? When it comes to, when it comes to that, so primarily that's 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 where the focus is for for us and sure at the moment. Obviously, we've got some technologies that are in there that can be adapted and and we're fortunate enough that you know with just, just, just three facets to show we've got sort of the consumer side and we've got the integrated system side and maybe further down the line we'll see integration of of those technologies that are used being elsewhere that could be, could be brought in but again you know that's that's just just speaking of something that's probably way down the line at the moment that i couldn't really i couldn't really comment on anymore jack i think at this, at this <laughs> Well, thank you, Stuart. Um, I am going to move on. I think there'll be some interesting comments on this next question from, from everybody. This does play a little bit into what we were just discussing. Um, this question was asked by Dick Crabb. I hope that I pronounced that correctly. But he asks, I really applaud your comments about sustainability, older equipment choices and quality. Do you think there could be a positive in focusing theatre towards its core? Less glitz, more acting and script. Um, I don't really know where I want to come to first on this one, so I'm just going to open it up to whoever would like to answer first. Less glitz, more acting in the script. Um, I'll answer. Uh, Please do. Yeah, that's a good. That's a that's a great question, Dick. Um, yeah, I I think it's a combination of both. I think it's going back to its core, um, but the way creative the the creative industry is at the moment and the side of it, I can't see it being less glitz um, and more acting and script because um uh, they're always pushing that boundary and and unfortunately or fortunately depending on how you look at it that boundary it tends to be more and not less um and if it is less it's very simplistic and very stylized art which you know something like um in, uh, was it encounters that um uh um Oh God, I can't forget that Gareth Fry Garrett. design. Was it brief? Yeah, um, you know where it's all immersive sound. That for me, it's yeah, it was very simplistic because it's one person on stage and and you know talking about headphones and stuff like that. But you know that's pushing the boundary. Um, but in terms of yeah, focusing it towards its core, less less glitz, more acting and script. Um, I think I think they'd be reluctant to go back that far um, in terms of the output on stage and and what the audience see. I think it comes back down to uh, finances again, to a certain extent as well. I, I think that commercial theatre uh, tries to, um, I mean, there's always a core theatre audience, right? They're going to see anything because they're theatre audiences, but to try and drag in tourists and, uh, and other people who maybe don't see theatre as their first port of call for a night out, um, they are pulling on the interests of of those individuals who watch a lot of TV and go to the movies, and so therefore all of the production qualities are are, are compete. We're competing really with you know uh, with special effects in movies and on TV and multi camera angle things that people are just used to seeing, and and also uh, people are so used to now having everything at their fingertips on a on a remote control, so they can decide what language they want to watch it in or they can change the perspective of of something or they can change the way that they're listening to it from a sound point of view or they can just simply turn it up or turn it down so i think the problem is 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 that our audience's expectations have gone almost beyond what theater was about so therefore commercial theater has become about being something a little bit and this is generalizing obviously but uh, it's it's gone beyond a bit what what the core values of of communication and storytelling of theater are and piled a huge you know truckload of pizzazz and glitter on top of it and bells and whistles and uh, automated scenery and and what have you in order to attract a bigger audience which i'm not against per se because obviously we would like a bigger audience but I, I don't know if that's what the question is around really is is have we gone a bit too far with that and lost some of the core values of it uh, my answer to that would be yes i think we have but in agreement with tony i don't don't know how you ever step back from that because that's the sort of the bar that's been set however as i said before maybe we have just hit a huge reset button with the covid experience and maybe we will 
have to or decide to uh, step down a bit with some of the production values, not make them any worse, you know, but just just maybe maybe some more traditional theatre um, effects or ideas could could actually be seen <laughs> almost as something quite new now. Ooh, that's that's revolutionary. Well, let's try that. You know, uh, who knows? Um, it's a good question though. Good question. Well, I'd like to come to I'd like to come to Vicky. <laughs> Uh, as our operator on the panel, are you going to chop in the SD9 and get the power craft <laughs> back out again? I mean, to be honest, at this point, I it does make you think about what what you want to do, and I actually just want to mix a show. Do you know what I mean? I, I would mix it pretty much on anything at this point. Um, I think another thing that we've not really talked about is is I think that during this time a lot of people have been doing a lot of writing um about different experiences and i think there's going to be a lot of pressure on the theatrical landscape to be more representative when it comes to the stories we're telling and who's telling them so i really hope that yeah we'll probably will continue in, in the commercial sector to to hit out some blockbusters with all the glitter and everything but i do think that maybe what will also become important will be to tell different stories and maybe at different scales um to be accessible to different people and different groups of people so i think that maybe that is something that's possible i don't think it'll be at the forefront of commercial theater right now but i wonder if you know outdoor theater goes back first then yeah maybe we are looking at more traditional storytelling in that regard um as our entry point back into what we're used to we will always push forward with technology because that's the nature of the world in which we live and some of that you know escapism is what people go to theater for but i think people's focus will be potentially more simplistic because they've sat in front of their TV for weeks and weeks on end. So maybe there is a place for that. Um, I don't think it's going to be at the forefront of commercial theatre, but I think it might exist elsewhere for sure. Zoe, I'll come to you on this. Yeah, I, I think it's really interesting because it, I think it depends very much on, on where you're experiencing your theatre. I think um, you know the the West End and the kind of big com commercial theatres are about a really you know show stopping night out, and I think that's you know like they do it so well, and it's such a beautiful thing that you you know yeah maybe you could say we could do without maybe all the jukebox musicals or you know but it's like actually this that that kind of evening out is amazing. Um, but I think if you're um, I'm just thinking about um, shows that I should have done over the last couple of months. Um, and uh they are like so we uh were meant to be in the brighton festival the brighton theater festival and so um that theater storytelling is very pared down and 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 very like script led basically and i was thinking about um things like fleabag um and shows that have come out of the edinburgh fringe and actually uh, you know there's a lot of work there which is amazing and very pared down and how that becomes and, and filters into um, commercial theatre. So yeah, I think the the um, the two sides of things are always always going to be there, but it's how you experience it and how you search it out. And I think what Richard was saying about the the different audiences, if you have a core audience that are really into storytelling and you get representative and um, uh, st uh, stories that you know the community want to hear then they'll seek those out and they, and they will always happen but yeah i think there's room for both both worlds thank you for answering that I'm, I'm conscious of the time we have run over i would there's a, three questions that come in that all relate to contracts and unionization and things of that nature and i think that it's important that we do cover those so if the panel is happy to do so i'd like to extend this out to, to maybe quarter past three just to just to cover some of that ground and i think what i'm going to do is just ask them a very quick fire so i won't come to every panelist but if you feel like you've got something that you'd like to say then please do let me know so the first one um, that i'd like to cover is from ewan and it's how do the panelists feel about unionizing for some consistency and general consensus within the industry I agree. I totally agree. Um, but you know, we have to look at each other first to start a union. Starting a union is not the easiest thing to do. Um, we have to be, we have to be all singing from the same hymn sheet first before even thinking about starting a union. And that means talking to each other and communicating with each other and being open with each other about the jobs and the contracts that we have. And you know, um, I know there's a great campaign at the moment, the sound wage campaign that's picking up steam. 
um, uh, Laurie and other people are dealing, that, dealing with that now. And we need sound designers, r rental companies as well, um, and manufacturers to a certain extent to get behind that as well and, and say, right, as a collective, yeah, um, although we might not be a union, but we're a strong collective. A bit like, um, yeah, Star, um, Star Trek, the Borg. <laughs> it's, yeah, we're made up of many, many. <laughs> <laughs> we are the Borg. We are the sound Borg. And um, let me know where to apply for role as Borg Queen. I think I'd quite enjoy that one. Uh, would anybody else like to uh, come in on that question? I think Tony's just uh, said it about advocating for each other and seeking out each other's opinions and being honest about wages and being honest about working conditions. I think that's the point of a union. I've become more engaged with my union during this process because I've suddenly seen the point um, where honestly I haven't really before. And so I've chosen to engage more with my union, with BEC2 um, and with the ASD as well, because I think the ASD has a lot of functionality that we look for in a union in terms of being a collective um, and in a position to offer advice. So I think, you know, I think it's important to, to deal with this as a collective. I think it's much stronger. That's how you know, I feel quite strongly about it. Well, on that point, the, the next question does answer that. So I'd like to throw this one out to the panel. And then the last question I'm going to put specifically to Zoe, actually. So the next one that I've got, this is for anyone to come in on. On contracts and fees post COVID, what would you advise engineers who would be willing to work for less as long as they can get involved in the industry again? Should there be an, a baseline for what's acceptable? So what engineers that are willing to work for less, should there be a baseline for what's acceptable? Uh, yes, there should be a baseline. Um, I'm pretty passionate about people who come in at the lower end of the industry and take away jobs um, from experience and not necessarily experienced people, but people who are getting paid the correct money, you know, undercutting, those people undercut. Um, but to be honest, I think post-COVID, um, there won't be many of those people about because the relationships that 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 theatre owners and producers have, have created and sound designers and rental companies have created, they're going to work with people they know they can trust and 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 also deliver. And normally those are the people who get paid properly or at least command a decent um, uh, wage or salary or, or can command a decent wage or salary and not go for the, oh, well, let's do this on the cheap. I'm going to get someone who I've never heard of or someone who, who knows it all on theory, in theory but hasn't got any experience of doing it so i'm all for i'm all for being getting young blood in, young new blood into the industry but there's the right way of doing it um and that's not the right way i believe yeah uh, i i'm i mean i i'm a great advocate of bringing bringing on new people in the industry and i and i think it's another it's another conversation that it's not at actually answering this question but i think you know we we need to take a bit more responsibility for the way we bring people into the industry and how we educate them in in the ways of the industry and uh and and then you you tend to have less of these kind of problems i think uh of course people who people want to work of course it's tempting to go and work for well under the money when especially when you haven't worked for months and i and i would never condemn someone for trying to feed their family or pay their rent or or whatever you know but you just have to be it's it's a big subject you have to be wise to the knock on effects of it but i would like to think that we sort of we could look to helping more in the future when we get back to work we could we could do more work placement stuff with people from colleges i i think we should have people who are want to be sound designers or, or sound operators should come and spend a few days in tech as a proper organized work placement and you know maybe we should go into their colleges and talk to them more you know maybe maybe manufacturers could help us with that you know maybe sure maybe we could do like some sponsored uh visits to schools or something but i, I think all of all of that education is really key to you understanding the industry you're coming into not just learning about how things about technical sound and how to use a sound desk it's about understanding how that works and and i think that kind of thing really helps people come in at the right level uh, so sort of saying what Tony said, you know, bring people in at the right level that they understand they're going to get paid this much and the reason why they get paid that much and 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 so forth. Um, yeah, it's a difficult subject because, I, as I say, I certainly wouldn't condemn someone for trying to earn a living, you know, especially in these very unprecedented times. OK, I'm going to leave this one open if anyone else would like to come in and answer it. It is a difficult question. Um, so I'll just give it a breath. OK, in that case, I've got a penultimate question and then a final round sort of, you know, 
any questions, question time, happiness, let's talk about pets and fluffy things like questions. So, but as a final one, I'm going to come to Zoe for this specifically. And then afterwards, if the panelists would like to come in, please do feel, feel free to do so. This is from Mark Edmondson. And Mark says, what do you think about getting these problems heard outside of the sound side of this industry, making sure that the producers hear your advice regarding staffing and practices? Yeah, I, it's a really hard one, isn't it? Because it's, it's, it's very easy for us, you know, I think in like kind of Twitter feeds and all that sort of like in the conversations that we have, we do end up having conversations with um, with people in our industry and you know we make our voices heard in our industry and I know there's been quite a push about trying to get that information outside um, I think there's a balance to be had I think between um, individual conversations where you know you've got your sound team talking to producers as we're trying to get shows up and running uh, to um, trying to focus our um, all of our voices and, and freelancers as a as a whole and, and trying to get that information out. I know like the, the freelancers make theatre um, work movement and, and 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 all the different associations coming together to try and present one voice. I think at the moment and I think especially with the way the government's working at the moment, I think it's it's important for us all to come together and try and have a single voice and a single message. Um, but yeah, that's a tricky one, isn't it? To try and get the voice out there. Yeah. It is. Does anybody else want to come in to answer that? I think it. I think it goes right back to what Tony said right at the very beginning. I think it's about being proactive rather than reactive. So making sure that we've got that voice at the table as decisions being made, rather than responding to policies that are being given to us. So, to just to, to quickly tie into another question about front of house positions, for example. I think it's too late as as a front of house operator to rock up and see that my mixed position's in the wing and go, this is ridiculous. It's kind of too late at that point to have the argument. The seats have been sold and the policy has been made and the risk assessments have been made. I think if we're making the, having those conversations first as a collective to get a bit of a consensus and sort of idiot check each other to make sure we're all on the same page and then be going being front footed and going forward and going, you know, when I'm signing a contract, I want to know this about the show because if it's not going to be something that I'm comfortable with I'm going to talk about it at that point with the people that actually need to hear it rather than getting in and having an argument with the stage manager that's that's not the right person I think it's about making sure we're having the right conversations with the right amount of information and at the right point of the process you know I what I would love to see is it becoming a thing where the mixed position is discussed in a very early production meeting because for the you know for now it's a health and safety thing, but going forward that'd be a great le legacy of of this whole thing. Is that being part of those early conversations? And I really hope that it encourages a parity, as exactly as you would come full circle, you know, parity amongst all theatre makers at that creative level. That these are all part of the theatre experience for all of us. You know. Yeah, uh, yeah, I, I I'll agree. I mean, and I'm sure Richard will back me up on this as well. Is is you know the experienced designers out there, they know that they're thinking of the whole team. They're thinking of everyone from the person who, you know, is prepping in the, in the speaker store right through to their number one operator. They're thinking of the whole team. So when they first have that initial meeting with a producer or or director or or, or whatever, um, you know, everything, all their decisions are based on how they're going to implement their team and how is their team going to work for them and how uh, how we as a designer are going to work for their team um and if there's any issues you know with uh, with um like for instance mixed positions you know we nip that in the bud straight away well we should be nipping in that bud straight away we know what we need and what we want you know what we want our operators to do is concentrate on learning the show mixing the show everything else you know we deal as a team and there's, there's people who can deal with that so once again, it's all that word about being collective and being together. And, you know, if the number three's got issue with an actor or backstage, you know, for whatever the issue is, they know they can speak to the sound designer or the production sound engineer or something like that. And between us all, we can talk to the right person and get it sorted. We don't, you know, one person is not on their own trying to deal with it. We are collective as a sound department and supporting each other. Okay. Well, if that, there's nothing else, I. 
conscious of the time we've smashed right past the, the yardstick um, and I'd like to just end on something a bit brighter. So we're going to come to each panelist individually. And the simple question that we're going to ask is, in light of everything that we've spoken about, the time that we find ourselves in, what are we looking forward to? What is positive? What are we looking forward to doing? And I am going to come to, um, uh, let's go with Richard Brooker first, because you're first on my screen. What are you looking forward to, Richard? Um, I think I think the thing I missed most is is being uh, collaborative, work, working with 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 key people uh, who 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 think like I do and and want to solve problems in the in the same way I want to. So I, I think uh, it'd be nice to sort of wake up the old grey matter and and get involved with people again and and create create some uh, exciting, hopefully um, exciting material for people to listen and watch and. So I think I'm just looking forward to getting getting going again, but but also I'm looking forward outside our industry. I'm kind of looking forward to just seeing what the knock on effect of all this has been, because I think we're still very much in uh, in a sort of a, a blinkered uh, way of viewing it because so many things haven't been tried yet. You know, um, I think we're in for the long haul. So I'm, I suppose I'm just looking forward to um, to feeling positive about uh uh, the things around us, if that's not oversimplifying it. And if I may say at this point, thank you very much to Shaw for doing these roundtable discussions, if this is the last time I get to speak, uh, because I think they're really important. I think uh, a lot of people will have got a lot from this, hopefully, uh, and not least ourselves. Certainly I have. Uh, the opportunity to discuss some of these issues um, has been great. So thank you to Shaw for putting this together. Oh, thank you, Richard. It's very kind of you. Um, let's come to speaking of Shaw, Stuart. What are you? What are you looking forward to? Um, seeing people, actually seeing people face to face, as lovely as this is, and I, 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 you know, to have those conversations again face to face is going to be great. Actually seeing a show, feeling music as well, you know, not just listening to it on headphones, but but actually be able to feel that show is going to be great. I am just looking forward to that, but um. Yeah, just just as Richard said, just echoing that collaborative. Seeing seeing your beautiful face all again in person will be a huge huge welcome to me. Um, Vicky, what are you looking forward to? Stand by sound Q one. Can't wait. Can't <laughs> wait. Um, <laughs> um, I can't wait to um be creative uh, and to be collaborative and to do all that work. Um, I'm looking forward to going back to this job that I love, but with a with a new sense of enthusiasm and energy and positivity. I think I've had to do a lot of work myself about reframing things in a positive way. And I'm looking forward to applying that to the next job that I do um, and helping uh, other people maybe feel that way as well. I feel a real strength, sense of community with the people in this in the sound world. And I'm really looking forward to throw my weight behind that um, as we go forward. And seeing everyone in real Amazing. life. Thank you. <laughs> um, Tony, what are you looking forward to? Um, banter. Really looking forward to the banter of colleagues and, you know, um, just, just being in yeah, being in the same space as real people, um, you know, and, you know, being able, being able to sit in a dark theatre for hours on end. Um, trying to create fit and match. I hate to say it now, but you know, I'm sure within a day I'll be moaning about it <laughs> as we all be. <laughs> um, yeah. And, and, but most importantly for me, um, professionally is to hear, is hearing that first downbeat of, of, of overture, you know, just hearing it. Okay. Now we're doing something here now. You know, it still, it still gives every show I do. Um, it still puts his it stands his up on my on my on my arms and my back on in you know, back of my neck because you know that's what we do it for you know, for that audience reaction and for that live feel. Amazing, thank you, Tony and uh, and Zoe. Take us out, last of the panelists. What uh, what are you looking oh, forward I to? I don't know. I don't think I should probably go last. Um, I uh, must be very honest in saying that what I'm actually looking forward to is my um, rescheduled uh, week away cottage. Um, so we were meant to go away in uh, in the March half term and we're actually going away <laughs> on the 1st of August. And so I get to spend uh, five or six days in a, in a different house, which is very mm. exciting to me. So that's my that's my main excitement. Is, uh, yeah, going to the Cotswolds with my children and my dogs and my husband. Lovely. 
Oh yeah. In okay. That order. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> in that order. Okay. Well, so that's uh, twenty-four. <laughs> Um, that takes us to 24, pretty much 25 past the hour. Thank you for those that have stuck around uh, for the extra 25 minutes. I want to thank um, our panellists for agreeing to do this. I think that was a really good discussion and we covered a lot of ground. And, um, yeah, thank you very much for taking the time out of your day to come and, and do these roundtables. Um, we will be back. We, we don't know what the next one's going to be yet. We, we are discussing that as uh, exactly at the moment. In fact, there is messages going around, but there will be another roundtable discussion uh, with another industry. So keep an eye open for that. If you've got any feedback for us, do feel free to get in touch. But in the meantime, um, thank you. Thank you for being here. Thanks again to our panelists and we'll see you on the next one.